This is a four-part video series on the Ford Model A transmission and how to make a cutaway. And you are watching part one, disassembly. Howdy again, it's Mr. Pete, your YouTube shop teacher. Welcome back to beautiful Studio A. The subject of this video series, which will be four parts, is the making of a cutaway of this Ford Model A transmission from about 1930. I had two of these, I'll show the other one in a second, but I chose this one as the uh, subject of the cutaway. Part one will be disassembly of this. Part two will be deciding how to cut it and cut away a portion of the case so you can see the gears. And then part three will be reassembly of it. And part four, I'll attempt to show you how it works. Thank you to Mr. George Bell for making some great videos on this. Check him out. And uh, he did not a cutaway, but he did assembly and disassembly of these Model A transmissions, which are pretty simple transmissions, three speed with a reverse, no synchronizers as we know them today. I actually have two of these Model A transmissions. This one I believe is a little bit older because it has the, the, emergent, the handbrake a little bit different here on the tower, but I arbitrarily chose to use this one for the cutaway. And I bought both of these at a, an auction uh, two years ago and I saved them from the scrap man. These two transmissions were laying in the grass and the auctioneer put his foot on one of them and said he's selling them together and the junk man you know, the man, scrap man, that carries a can of orange spray paint bid $2.50. I bid $5 and got them for the pair. I believe that he knew they were not worth more than $5, you know, at the scrapyard. So that, that was the going price. But this one will get remounted in a Ford Model A someday. This one is the subject of this video. The oil drain plug on the bottom has a three-quarter pipe thread and fortunately the oil was drained out of this transmission probably during the time when Truman was in office. But anyway, I made this steel plate with a flange on it and this supports the transmission and allows me to work on it, I think, pretty conveniently because it is fairly heavy and I've got it on my turntable so this is going to be fun. I think I'll start by taking off the shifting tower here with six bolts. Okay, there are six bolts here holding the shifting tower into place. And the tower will lift right off. And you can see the two shifting forks. Now, I'll be talking much more about this assembly later on in another part. Now, this is the input end. The bell housing has already been taken off, long gone, bolts into these holes here. This is the spline that goes into the clutch, and this is the uh, shaft that goes into the pilot bearing. This is the throwout bearing, as you know it. And this will come off real easy just by loosening that spring and pulling this off. There was a grease fitting here, but it's not a regular zerk as we know them now, some other morphodite that they used years ago. This is the universal joint. Some of you call this a knuckle. It's held on with one bolt and the torque tube bolted to these bolt holes here on this flange. They are long gone. I don't know what happened to them, but I'll have to loosen this up. Obviously some of these bolts I loosened up earlier, so I do not have to struggle with them during the actual demonstration. This is a fine thread bolt. They made a lot of these Model A's, you know and that pulls right off of the spline. And this U-joint is in quite good condition actually. 
I've changed a lot of these on the old 54 Chevys and so on and clear into the 60s. They looked a lot different than this, but you know the, what vibration and shudder you get when you got bad U-joints. Over a 50-year period, generous amounts of grease were applied through this Zerk right here. So as you can see, there are great gobs of filthy, semi-hardened grease right here. So give me about 15 minutes to get most of that out of there, and then I'll get back. And at this point, you can't even see the bolts inside of there. See you in a minute. You know what? My mother always told me to put newspapers down, and being the ever-obedient son, I did, and I got about three ounces of grease in there. And as you can see now, these four bolts are safety wired. So I will cut off those wires just pretty much like what they do on an aircraft. So they didn't, Henry didn't want any chance of those bolts coming loose, obviously. Boy, oh boy, were those bolts tight. There was no chance of them coming out on their own. Now that'll be easier to clean up in my parts washer. I, oh, that's right, I don't have a parts washer. I guess I forgot to show you, there was a broken bolt off in there from eons ago. Okay, I'm back from lunch and I have this part cleaned up. And that is a normal Zerk. It was just so dirty I couldn't tell. Now remember, this is not a complete restoration. I will put it together without gaskets and with the old bearings, whether they're good or bad. And I do believe this was installed upside down. The grease Zerk should be on the bottom. That way you can grease it from under the car. Otherwise, I think you've got to take the floor pan out of the cab in order to, to grease this. So lay that aside and... I'm not sure what this is called exactly, but it's the keeper for these two shafts. Keeps them from rotating and keeps them from coming out. Again, I'm not really explaining how this works, but now I can pull this shaft out. And this is not a continuous shaft. It is coupled together, which we'll talk about later, and can rotate as one or separately. So I'm going to take out this, I'm going to call it a half shaft, but that's, it's a portion of the main shaft. And I'll leave the bearing and that retainer on there. But as I pull it out of there, there are two sliding gears here. And this is second and third gear. And the other one is reversed and first gear, or low. That'll slide right off on a spline, and then this shaft and bearing can be pulled out. Now I will remove these four screws that hold this flange. Remember, this is the input and the pilot bearing shaft and the spline that goes into the clutch. Some of this I know I'm repeating, but it doesn't matter. And of course, educators would call repeating uh, oneself as reinforced learning. You know, they had some catchword for everything, so someone could write a book, which no one wanted to read. If you have trouble remembering where things go, it helps to take a few pictures along the line with your phone. Although this is a pretty simple compared to the Powermatics that we used to take apart. So this will pull right off as such. And of course the gasket is getting destroyed, but I don't care. We got a little something there that is holding it. There. Looks to be in good condition. And now this half shaft will pull out with the main drive gear. 
So all of the power from the engine goes through this shaft and into this gear and then is distributed into the various gears inside of the case, the transmission. And you know what, that bearing seems to be pretty good. Main drive gear. Now within the housing, this bulge right here, is the reverse idler gear. So I will push that shaft out, not a very long shaft, and the gear drops loose and I should be able to pull it out if I can grab a hold of it, but I might need to get a pliers. Reverse idler gear, notice the bronze bushing in there, and the oil hole. Set that aside, and now there's another shaft here. It is called the cluster gear shaft, or the, uh, oh, let me pull it out of there if I can. I think I'm going to have to drive that out. I call that the cluster gear shaft. I guess I should have called it the counter shaft. And using a brass punch, out it comes. Pretty slippery. Counter shaft, lay it aside, and then now the cluster gear can come out. Pretty tight fit, and there are, whoop, I dropped one of the bearings. Here's my punch, and there's a roller bearing in each end, and they are not the same length, and then in the middle, a spacer. I will talk about the names of these gears later on, they're all on one shaft, or all on one casting, I should say, and ride on one shaft, and that's why they call them uh, a cluster gear. That must have been an expensive part to make. So there's the empty transmission case, ready to be cleaned. It weighs much, much less, so it'll be easy to handle now. Now let me lay all the parts out in a row, take a look at them, and then we'll be about at the end of part one and overnight or in the next few days I will clean all these parts very thoroughly. And that's a big job in itself. I was looking now, I was going to paint this black, but I believe the original color was probably this real dark green. I don't know if that shows up on the video, but I think I'd like to paint it that color. It would be pretty awesome. And I won't paint the inside. Fairly clean inside. There are all the parts laid out awaiting cleaning and surprisingly enough there are very few fasteners involved in putting this whole thing together so it's extremely clever design and I have the patent drawing that I will show in one of the videos and of course the inventor is Henry Ford which he probably in reality had very little to do with the actual design of this he just had a whole crew of engineers but as usual Edison and Ford took credit for everything, didn't they? And then over here, and I haven't talked about it yet, is the, the tower with the shift forks, and that'll be in one of the other videos. So I hope you enjoyed part one. That pretty much concludes it. And I'll see you in part two after everything is cleaned up and I decide through great deliberation how I am going to cut this case for the best view in the cutaway transmission for a Ford Model A. This is Mr. Pete saying see you next time in part two. Thank you for staying over for extra credit and in this portion, and you don't have to watch this, I'm going to disassemble at least partially the uh, shifting tower and talk a little bit about the forks and the parts. I'm not going to take the shifting lever out of here because there's a very heavy duty spring in here that's kind of hard to deal with and it really doesn't matter for what I'm doing here. 
if I have that apart. And I'm only taking the forks out of there because there is the possibility that I need to put this on the bandsaw and saw part of this out for the cutaway. So that's why I'm covering that. But you might find this interesting. Okay, these are the shifting forks. And they can be inserted in these grooves here on these two gears. I don't know if I've got the right one in place. And that just allows you with the shift lever to move, slide one gear one way or the other. Right now they're in a fixed position, but the first thing I need to do here is to, in order to remove the forks, is to drive these pins or these rivets out there. They're somewhat of a hollow rivet, but I want to get both of these shifting shafts out of here. As you can see here, there are two somewhat hollow rivets. I've already compressed one and driven it back in, and it's just a matter of knocking them out with a punch. See now that fork is loose on the shaft. Now I'll knock out the other one as well off camera. Okay, these are the rivets. I said hollow, but they're only hollow on the very end. They are made of steel and they are meant to be flared out. So they're not really reusable, but I will attempt to reuse them. I'm sure I would have to make up something otherwise. It's not a Home Depot item. Well, I'm still not ready to get the forks out of there until I pull these two rods out and they're still held in there by the detent assembly. So let me remove this screw here, which is actually just a plug. It just plugs the hole. Okay, I'm going to remove this one first. And you know, these are hardened, so the pliers will not leave a mark on it though. And there it comes. And these two rods are not the same. I may have said that before, and that allows this fork to come out. And the two forks supposedly are identical parts. Now this one comes out easily because there's no longer any spring pressure against it. And you can see the holes there that the pins fit in. Now usually these are pretty well worn in here. And you can see that the ball here on the end of the shift lever is, well, you, you probably can't see at all, but it should be perfectly round, but in fact it's got flats on it. Now I should be able to turn it upside down and the spring assembly should come out. Okay, I should be able to loosen it through this hole with a punch or another small object. And it's starting to come. It's just so greasy in there. And there's this detent spring and the detent cap. And there's still one more cap in here yet. Some people call them bullets. Okay, this is a bit of a balancing act, but uh, and I'm not using the spring because it's just so unruly and strong, but the two detent buttons or bullets are sitting right here and they are in one of the detents, but that's just to show you what's going on when you're shifting from, let's say, one detent to the other. And you can feel that as you're shifting. Well, there's all of the parts other than the spring and the keeper and the actual shifting rod. And it pained me very much to cut the shifting rod off. But it was just so long and unruly and kept hitting me in the chin, so it had to go. It could always be welded back on. But then again, I'm cutting the whole thing apart. Even though it's a 90-year-old antique, I feel a little bit bad about it. Quite a bit of wear on the forks, but they will work. And as I said, I don't intend to take this out at this time because it's, it's kind of tricky and difficult. So I'm going to clean this up, and uh, then it's 
ready to paint and cut away and all of the other good stuff that will be taking place in part two. Thank you for sticking around for the extra credit and I'll see you in the next part. This is Mr. Pete saying so long for now.